Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's great to be here in person, and hello to those of you on Zoom as well. Qué bueno verlos a ustedes. Estamos en persona. We're here today to discuss the draft framework for the Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Nos encontramos hoy día acá para poder discutir el borrador del marco del Consejo Asesor de Justicia Ambiental. Thank you so much for joining us today as we map out the beginning stages of forming the council, which we'll be referring to as EJAC. We're currently in the public comment period, which started May 15th for the draft framework. We do encourage you to provide us with feedback and you'll have the opportunity to do so after the presentation. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be posted on our website. Next slide, please. We do have Spanish interpretation available on Zoom and in person. We have interpreters and headsets available in the back for those of you in person. Uh, for those of you on Zoom, find the globe interpretation icon and select whether you want to listen in English or Spanish. We'll now hear these instructions from the Spanish interpreter, please. I'll, I'll do it. Seleccionar idioma preferida. Miren en esta área. Instrucciones de computadora, escojan en el mundo y luego escojan español. Instrucciones para teléfono inteligente, pueden irse donde dice más o more y ahí pueden escoger el idioma. Next slide. <clears throat> Thank you, Elsa. Um, here's the information if you'd like to join us by phone, and we do have both an English and a Spanish call-in number. The phone numbers are listed on our websites as well, and we'll post it in the chat. Uh, we'll now hear from the Spanish interpreter again. Información de llamada. Número de llamada de Zoom en inglés es 669-900-6833. Identificación de la reunión es 865-9304-5037 y ingrese la tecla número de llamada en español 916-535-5037. ID de la conferencia 254-0127-68E. Ingrese la tecla. Thanks, Elsa. Now I'll go over the meeting agenda. Next slide, please. Um, we'll have a presentation on the draft framework by Diana Ballesteros who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Legislation and Regulatory Review. And after that, we'll open it up for your feedback and we'll have Serlene Grant, who's the Deputy Director of the Office of Environmental Equity, facilitate that portion. After we hear from you, uh, Diana will close with information about next steps. Uh, next slide, please. For questions from the media, please contact Devin Hutchings, who's our public information officer. Her contact is posted here and in the chat as well. Uh, that's it for opening announcements and I'll hand it over to Diana now. Thank you, Asha. Um, again, my name is Diana Vasquez Ballesteros. I'm the Lodge Director for the Department of Toxic Substance Control. Um, and thank you for everybody who is virtually watching us and who's actually here in person to talk about the Environment Justice Advisory Committee framework. Um, this is our second meeting that we have on the framework specifically to receive comments from the community and also individuals who um, wanted to learn a little bit more about the framework and why the framework was developed in the first place within the Department of Toxic Substance Control. Um, with that, I do want to um, uh, indicate that I also have uh, both the Board Environmental Safety Board members, Georgia Gomez, here to my left. And I also want to um, acknowledge uh, our board member, Lise Ruiz, who's actually joining us virtually. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Ruiz. Um, and she's going to be expecting a baby. That's why she's um, out there virtually. So definitely we're missing her um, here. But I, I do want to give credit to both of these individuals and also um, 
Swati, who is executive director for the Board of Environmental Safety, who has been work, they've been working with us in the last couple of months to really get this framework um, for public view. And really, I think for us is, is the, really the understanding that this framework is just a baseline for us to see how we can improve on the framework before we finalize the framework so we can actually obtain members um, to, in, to be participants of the committee and really help both the board and also the department on how we can look at environmental justice issues within our work. Um, with that, I will ask if we can go into the next slide. And do another, yeah, background. Um, so a little bit more on the background and the framework. So the framework came out of conversations that we were having for the department, specifically conversations related to governance and fee reform. Um, and really looking at programmatic changes that we can do within the department. And the, these conversations started really long before the passage of SB um, 158, which was passed on July 14th, 2021, um, and really gave the department an ability to have a little bit more authority on what we are able to do as a department, also with the new creation of a board. Um, the Board of Environmental Safety came out of reform as well to really provide an additional layer of oversight and transparency to to the department. In addition to that, there was um, individuals from the environmental justice uh, community that really asked for a space that we can create within the department and also within the board, um, specifically it's unique to environmental justice communities and members of environmental justice communities to see if how they can provide advice recommendations um, and also more than anything, provide consultation to both the department and the boards and on its functions and operations. Um, and you can see here with the language that was developed, and this is actually in statute, that um, it basically provided the department with the authority to develop um, a form that represents communities across California impacted by the, the Department of Toxic Substance Controls programs and activities, and to provide environmental justice um, advice, consultation, and recommendations to the director of the department, but also um, to the board members within the Board of Environmental Safety. Again, because the board was newly established within the reform efforts, um, the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee was established within the department initially, thinking that, you know, as we start really looking at making this um, committee a permanent committee, because right now the funding that was provided for the development of this committee was actually. Um, you know, it was it was more of in a short term basis to really see if this is something that um, the community that's going to be serving within the board, but also within the department of the board um, is really seen as essential. And if it's something that if if, you know, personally, um, you know, being in those conversations, we always really thought of really creating a permanent space, but also knowing that, you know, we don't want to create a permanent space if it's not really warranted by the communities who are going to be serving um, within that. Um, advisory council. Um, so the, the the development of the thinking was we're going to create a, an environmental justice framework that can actually provide some guidance on what this advisory council should be um, working towards. Um, also, the mechanisms of how we fund the, the operations of this council um, was specifically an allocation of $2 million with ability for us to start um, providing reimbursement to the members of this advisory um, starting July 1st, 2023, with the passage of the, uh, the budget bill that was just passed recently, um, about two, two weeks ago. Um, and then also um, with an end date of fiscal year 24-25. But again, with always the intention of really extending um, the permanency of this, if if it's if it's something that the community along with the department and the board are feeling that is something that um, we are willing to actually go ahead and extend um, for a permanent way of actually working with with each other. So um, we can have a little bit more further conversations on kind of the mechanics of that, but at least we wanted to provide a little bit more background on how the formation of the board of the, of the committee um, and also how this advisory council was gonna be working directly with the department and the board. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to board member Georgia Gomez, um, who is gonna be providing a little bit more context of the framework um, and then also some of the elements within the framework. With that, Georgia. Thank you. And uh, I wanna make sure that our Spanish interpretation is working before I continue, yes. Should we pause a little bit? Is there a need for a small break? 
Yes. Should we take like a five minute? Okay. We apologize, but we're having some technical difficulties. And we want to make sure that as we proceed, we're incorporating you know, all the necessary languages that we've provided. So we'll be back at 1120-ish. Thank you. Okay, we were going to continue. Yes. All righty. So we apologize once again, but I'm glad that we are able to address some of the issues to ensure that everybody's included in this this course. Uh, my name is Roger Gomez. I'm one of the board members to the Environmental Safety. I've been um, one of two, including my board member, uh, Lisa Brees, uh, working on developing this framework. Um, so as Deanna was explaining the the call for this um, frame for, for this group to be established, um, I'm gonna go a little bit further on describing the proposal that we have right now on what uh, EJAC would look like and its function. Um, and all of it is in draft form. I wanna stress that because the purpose of us having this workshop and continuation of, 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 of these uh, conversations, it really is to hear from the public to make to help us improve and make this structure stronger to ensure that we are addressing environmental justice in the state of California through the work that DTSC does. So um, the purpose right now of uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, the purpose right now is for this body to be, although it's going to be housed under DTSC, uh, we are hoping that this body is an independent group um, advising and creating um, recommendations to both DTSC and the BES board to really ensure that we are um, operating from the lens of environmental justice and trying to prevent um, some of the wrongdoings and how we can do address some of the issues that our communities are currently working through um, and having to live. So this would be an independent body giving direction and support to both being as the, the Board of Environmental Justice as well as UTSD. Um, we are hoping that this body works closely with the impacted community members uh, throughout California. So as the body is getting put together, we're hoping that they, as when they need in their community, their framework, as how they're going to need, where they're going to need, and create that whole calendar, that they keep in mind some of the impacted communities and that they would go there to really engage the community and try to identify some of the areas that the Department of Toxic Substance Control should be addressing in their jurisdiction what has, uh, as they develop their work really yearly. Um, next slide, please. Some of, the, um, one of the key principles within this framework is ensuring that we are um, committing to the principles of environmental justice. Uh, we want to make sure that as the body of EJAC is getting developed and they start developing their own structure, their own governing structure, their work plan, their how they're getting, where they're going to meet, uh, how, how, how often they're going to meet, they, in which areas they're going to focus. And we want to make sure that in in, in the front of their decisions that the environmental justice principles are incorporated to ensure that we succeed uh, collaboratively. So that's something that is very critical for this board uh, to ensure that we are successful um, and they, they are guided by those principles. Next slide, please. The other function of the framework is uh, we want to make sure, as I stated earlier, that uh, the, the the structure and, and the outcomes of this body are very much driven and centering community-based approach. Um, so as, as we're putting together the group, 
uh, we want to make sure that once they're once they're put together and they're moving forward and they're developing their their way in which they're going to be working, that they keep that in mind that um, they engage the community and they're they're working from that lens, uh, entering the community based approach, uh, creating measurable goals, uh, creating specific outcomes and getting that feedback from the residents as well. Um, next slide, please. In conjunction to the community-based approach, we also want to make sure that this body is developing a strategy uh, in which they're going to be hoping to achieve basically their work plan for the year. Um, and they're also going to be developing structures and how they're going to be engaging with DTSC um, in, in terms of what are the areas that DTSC should work on to improve um, the work that they do. Specifically, some of the areas are in community engagement. Um, that, that's an area that we do call out, but it's not limited to that. Um, next slide, please. And then, um, obviously, this this body is uh, critical on um, the success that DTSC and the BES board will, will, will have. So we want to make sure that there is a bridge between the work that both of these bodies have and that this group is really giving direction and advice to ensure that we are achieving environmental justice and the policies and then the work that we're doing, that the really DTSC is doing, but also the work that um, the, the BES is doing as well. So they're going to be um, closely engaging both of these bodies. Next slide, please. So in terms of the, the Okay, in terms of the membership, uh, right now the framework calls for a minimum of five uh, representatives on the on the EJAC. Um, there was a trail bill that is, has um, made reference to there should be no more than 25. Um, members on the EJAC in terms of how big the, the body can be. Um, but right now we're starting with the floor and referencing in the, the framework and we're saying that at least five members, um, but up to no more than 25. Um, the role that the, the framework does call out for two minutes, um, but that's an area that could be revised as we move forward. Um, and, um, beyond, and, and also right now, because the bill just did establish a funding mechanism that will be supporting this, this group, um, right now it is scheduled to operate until June of 2025. Uh, but if there is evidence that there is uh, need and support, we're going to work to ensure that uh, then we can continue the continuation of the group, but that is work that is to be determined as we establish the work and then the group is uh, doing the work. Our next slide. And we also want to make sure that, I mean, we got to recognize that California is pretty long um, and we're a very diverse um, set of community members. Uh, so we want to make sure that there is uh, this body is reflected of the geographical area in terms of representation, um, as well as the diversity that we have in California. Uh, we want to be mindful that there, we're hoping that this body is has representation from the urban, rural, and suburban communities to ensure that all those voices are guiding the work that uh, the agency is doing. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, in inclusivity is critical. So we want to ensure that it also the body is uh, diverse and inclusive uh, and reflective of who we are as Californians. 
Um, so we're very much mindful of that. And that's what we're hoping that this body is uh, a reflection of that. Um, next slide as well, please. And then uh, in terms of who we're hoping to, to be a part of, aside from inclusion um, and geographical representation, Obviously, this this body is set to address environmental justice issues and, and really guide those principles and the agency. So we want to make sure that uh, although it's not limited to, but we do want to uh, uplift the residents that are impacted living in EJ communities, uh, but it's not limited to that. We want to make sure that our young voices are also represented. Uh, so there is a, a, a reference to that um, and uh, in, in just overall expertise as well on hazardous materials, obviously, because this is the work that this agency oversees. So we do want to make sure that there's um, re reflection of that in the body. Next slide, please. So we want to make sure that as we're striving for transparency and accountability, that this group also has the same structure um, as they're developing their, as, as the community that it will be um, identifying who becomes a member of. They're going to be developing a criteria um, and that criteria will be available to the public uh, to ensure that there is uh, the process is, is as transparent as it can be. Um, and and um, so that way that everybody understands um, how the selection process would be established. So the idea is that there will be a committee established that is three representatives uh, from um, EJ community groups. Uh, there are two representatives from the DTSD staff and DTC will determine who that is. Leadership will determine who those folks will be. There are two BES um, Board of Environmental Safety uh, members. And right now, uh, it doesn't mean that it would be myself and, and uh, board member rules, but we could be those folks that are representing in the committee. And this committee would create uh, the criteria and how, who and how uh, the membership would look like um, and create the application process. Um, there's also um, the the EJAC would be supported by uh, staff, um, and we we are also mindful that we want to make sure that the application, the process to be a part of this body that is inclusive as possible. So we, there will be staff designated to help out people that might not ha have access to uh, technology. Uh, to be able to participate and apply for. So we're going to be as, as supportive of ensuring that um, residents and applicants uh, have access to applying for uh, the EJAC and be part of um, beyond computers, beyond technology. So we want to make it very accessible in terms of encouraging participation in this group. Next slide, please. So part of the structure, we are making reference to, um, but also are extremely vague and it was very intentional um, and developing the governing structure. We wanna, we left it open. So once the EJEC is established, we wanna make sure that the, the, the group is creating its own governing structure. Uh, we, we, we have called out, we have given um, examples, uh, but we're not saying that it should be in such a way. Uh, it's just for conversation for the body to lead, so that the body itself is going to create its own governing structure. Um, we also are leaving it um, open for the EJAC to determine its meeting structure. Um, is schedule and also how they're going to be interacting with DTSC and the BES board. 
Um, and that was very intentional because we didn't want to pre-assume or recreate the structure ourselves. Um, so we really wanted to give its independence and allow room for the body to create a structure and the how and how they should interact with BES and DTSC. So right now it's open-ended. Uh, there are examples and, and, uh, and we can also, as the body uh, comes together, uh, we, we are willing to give support and ideas and what that can look like. We did the, 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 the folks that have been working on creating this, this framework did um, look at other EJACs uh, that are operating. So we have that analysis that can be shared with this group. Um, if it helps the group to create a governing structure that's available. Um, and then uh, there are examples from other EJACs that have uh, up to three uh, directors, uh, chairs, or two chairs uh, where they chair, they, they, um, they support one another to really run the, the meetings and whatnot. So there's different structures out there, uh, but we really wanted the, the body to, to create its own structure. And we will give those examples to them as once they, they gather together. Um, let's see what else. Um, there's also uh, the ability for the body to hire outside expertise assistance as well, um, if need be, but we're, we're leaving it up to them. Uh, the body will create its own work pool and um, and they can also create ad hoc committees as they wish, uh, working groups or committees as they wish. So the structure, the how, um, and what type of support they would need is all really, uh, um, uh, we're giving them the authority for them to determine all, the, all of that. And um, with that, we're going to open up the public uh, public input process, and I'm going to turn it to Sherman Grant, um, our Deputy Director of Office of Environmental Equity. Before that, um, I, I wanted to chime in and really um, ask the public for their input and, and, and ideas on, on, on a lot of these things. We understand that there's a big ask for the for the EJAC on, on um, you know, on what they have to do, develop their own structure, and, and also, you know, communicate with, with EJ front and represent EJ frontline communities. But um, if people have ideas on what they would like the EJAC to focus on specifically, I think this is a good space to do that, to provide that, to, to even, um, you know, have have a voice to give to to the future EJAC on, on, on what things, um, participants here and in the future or, or people who will be commenting in the future would like to see as, as areas of focus um, for advice. But yeah, I'll, I'll hand it over to Sterling. Thank you. So we, we've gotten marching uh, topic, uh, discussion topics from, from the board member. Um, as well. So again, I'm Serlene Grant, and I am the Deputy Director uh, for the Office of Environmental Equity, and I'm glad to meet those of you I'm meeting for the first time, and thank you for coming. So we've heard a lot about uh, what could possibly happen with the EJAC, EJAC, EJAC. and so we want to get your ideas about what's possible. They're telling me I have to be right in front of the mic, okay? So I don't wanna have my back to y'all. Um, so from what you've heard, you've heard a little bit about membership possibilities, how that could how that could be at least five members. It doesn't have to be five members from different stakeholder groups. We've heard about the selection committee and we've heard about some of the implement, implementation, um, and some of the structure and how it might work with DTSC and the board. So from those of you in the room, do you have any comments or questions about that? Yes, ma'am. Please, so we can get it. So we can all hear you. So we can all hear you. Okay. Um, is this okay? 
So my name is Debbie Bayer, and I live in Richmond, and I'm a member of the Richmond Shoreline Alliance. And also, we're a member of the entire Bay Area Coalition of uh, that pays attention to toxic sites in different community groups all over the Bay Area. And um, first, I want to state something obvious, which is that environmental justice is really central to um, the DTSC's mission or area because most toxics were dumped in areas where poor people or people of color lived. I mean, you know, it's not a pop, pop problem up in Piedmont, as far as I know. Um, uh, but it is a problem uh, in a room around the Bay, whether it's West Oakland, Bayview Hunters Point, Treasure Island, the Zemeca site, and um, I can just keep naming them. Um, whatever that slab place is, it's north, uh, up, the, up the coast a little bit from Richmond. And I have been, it, it's been frustrating. The reason there's been all this reform of the DTSC is because there's been so many complaints about the DTSC's history in the past. We were um, community activists and we must have felt um, like the organization that's supposed to protect them has not been protecting them. And it has rather been standing on the side of placating us and telling us that everything's all right when it's not all right, and that given allowing developments to go forward, which really concern the neighborhoods. And so I don't want this to, I mean, I am totally, really um, impressed with what you've come up as a framework, and I'm really glad it's being done. But it's kind of weird when you read the DTSC's mission, and when you read the BES's mission, and when you read the index mission, it's all about protecting people and, and including environmental justice. And so in a way, we're creating an advisory board to advise BES, which is an advisory board to advise DTSC. And, um, and the, the, the difference is that the EJET board will have direct representation from the community instead of um, uh, being hired by the state. Um, and that would, that's a change. But still, it's, I wonder, several questions. Um, what is the budget? It, it says here that the EGF board will devise their own budget, but, but it's going to be budgeted through the state. And I'm sure there's already some kind of budget, some kind of knowledge of the budget. Um, will the EGF board um, elect their own chair? Because the chair is going to help um, what did it say? Focus with the BES and DTSC kind of decide where to focus. And will that be a chair that's elected among the five or however many people on the EJF board? We're going to focus on uh, areas, what are areas to focus and what deliverables? And I don't know what deliverables mean. So that's a question. And um, in the past, well, I've, I've, I've talked about um, that's a big area, but there are places like, you know, Santa Susana in the South and, and other places that where community organizations have also, also, also felt very frustrated and ignored. I've been active personally. My activity came in because of the Zeneca site where we think there has to be a much more thorough cleanup than the DTSC thinks there has to be especially since we've got Zeneca on the hook as a responsible party and they have unlimited funds. So it's not like the state's going to have to pay for it. And there is a question of putting 4,000 housing units on that site. And it's been a battle that's being fought for about 20 years. And the people on the community advisory group which have been working in Lyson with the DTSC have gotten nowhere. They have, what have they done is developed an incredible expertise about what's on the site, different cleanup methods, what works, what has not been proven to work. 
and the dangers in even removing the toxics in place under the pressure of sea level rise and the greater danger of putting housing on top of it to those residents. So those are the kind of questions that I'm bringing up. Thank you. Thank you. You had quite a list of questions, quite a lot. Some of them I think we can have some response to you right now. Some I think are going to be things that we have to look at as we plan and roll out the EJAC. So what I heard was uh, even just the role of the advisory board to the advisory board to the advisory board to kind of paraphrase you. Um, question about the budget mm -hmm. and um, deliverables. What are the deliverables? So, Thank if you. you. Yeah, and, and I can definitely take a little bit of the budgets and um, both uh, board member Gomez and, and myself can talk about the deliverables and a little bit of, of really the premise. But I do want to first thank you, Debbie. I, you know, I think the fact that you're here, you know, on a Wednesday afternoon morning to just be able to provide your, your guidance. I know, you know, we have been personally involved on Seneca. At least I've been here for almost three years. Um, it's a lot. Just want to acknowledge that it's a lot. And I think one of the things that came out of reform is acknowledging that the department wasn't doing what it needed to do. So I just want to acknowledge that. And I think that's one of the things I think we're trying to really create a baseline of there's things that could have happened 10, 15, 20 years ago that should have happened. But we, you know, it's it's we can focus on that and learn. And what can we do now to really prevent the next 15 to 20, 30 years? And I think really trying to really figure out the, the conditions that we have to work under to prevent the wrongs that, were, that, that happen, right? And I think a lot of it is, is really educating what the department does and has authority and how do we work with our partners and entities and really creating more of a community focus approach. And that's something that we're really figuring out with the Environment Justice Advisory Committee, uh, how we can work with communities who are directly impacted by our work. And our work, you know, deals with cleanup sites, but also deals with permitting sites and also deals with existing sites and future sites. And really looking at how do we start really building a framework that is putting public health and people who are in the environment first. And I think really figuring out how do we do that, that's that's where the Environment Justice Advisory Committee plays a really pivotal role in the way we're as a department, but also I think as the board, how they can actually be learning from this committee, right? And and I do agree that, um, you know, this is new for everybody involved, right? And then the mission of the department was always to protect public health and the environment. But to your point is there we could have done a little bit better, right? And I think I think what well, what are those different functions, and how do we actually look at that in a way that is going to be collective? Um, and it's it's difficult, you know, as a state agency, it's is a state agency, it's bureaucracy. And I think at the end of the day, is how do we take some of those bureaucracies and learn, and how to really minimize the entry points for community members to raise their concerns, also to help individuals understand what we're able to do based on the authority. And if, you know, I'm here on behalf of the Office of Legislation and Regulatory Review, is there anything that we need to be mindful of really figuring out of what additional authorities we need for the future so we can actually hold individuals accountable, including responsible parties or any other facilities in the state, right? And I think this is going to be a collective conversation to Serlene. This is going to be an ongoing discussion. I think on the budget side specifically, uh, we were able to um, allocate at least $2 million for this effort. We realized that community members have already spent a lot of time, including yourself, in meetings years after years without being compensated. And we wanted to change that for at least the, the members who are going to be participating in this board. Also, in addition to comp compensating their time, because we are going to be mindful that we're going to be receiving advice and recommendations from these members, so we should be you know, paying them according to at least what we're able to, um, as in addition to their, their time, also travel. Because what we, as board member Georgette uh, mentioned, is 
the Bay Area is one place, but, you know, at least we've functioned throughout the state. So how do we make it accessible and actually easy for the, these members to be a part of those discussions? So travel is going to be compensated. Lodging is compensated. And, and I think for us is how do we start minimizing some of the barriers that we have seen? Um, okay. Have we, what we have seen, at least with other advisory committees throughout the state, of, you know, I think access to, to being able to participate um, and that's how we were able to actually provide at least some compensation on that. We know it's not enough. We know that. But I think trying to really figure out what is enough as we start really looking at um, making this committee or this advisory council more of a permanent structure. And I think for us is really figuring out this in the next two years as we start developing this council um, to really see what we need and what else do we need to bring into the discussion so we can actually make it workable for everybody involved. So at least on the budget side, there, there has been some allocation. Also, we were able to be granted authority to do the, the, the compensation um, to the members and also be able to pay for, for travel, like I mentioned. So at least on the mecha mechanics of budgeting, there's but you know some monies there. Um, and then the department is going to be providing guidance on how to provide more of a budget for the next two years in consultation with the EJAC. And that can also mean contracting services. So if the committee feels that they need to contract services, they can actually go ahead and do that um, with the department's assistance, but at least having them actually let us know who they want, they want to contract with. Um, so that's another authority that we were able to get. So at least that's a little bit on the budgeting. I don't know if you want to talk about the deliverables. Yeah, I appreciate that. And yes, thank you, Deborah, as well, for engaging and, and asking um, if there's specific recommendations. We also welcome them. We want to make sure that this body is as strong as it can be to ensure that they are guiding um the agency to achieve environmental justice as they make decisions on their regulations what well, that's the intent um, the deliverables are based on what the body will determine if they let's example not set in stone this is just an example if they want to focus on um because bes is can oversee permitting challenges right um if they want to guide us on, on on how that should look like, we just went through the process of of updating how that can look. Um, but if they want to give us additional guidance, we would welcome that. Um, we have other areas that we're going to be focusing on as well. So we want to make sure that we are gathering uh, input and we want to be able to go to this body to say, hey, we're about to uh, launch the process of creating our fee structure, reevaluate the fee structure for permits. What should that look like or what are the areas that we should be looking at to ensure that the fees are set accordingly, right? We would love to hear from folks that are impacted by these permits um, and what those fees could look like. Um, in terms of what DTSC does, uh, there's different areas that the department yearly sets its goals, right? Um, do, does this body, do they want to look at some of those areas um, to ensure that they are achieving environmental justice and, and giving them guidance. This is what it should look like. And this is what we hope that you make different decisions based on this, right? Um, so the body itself is gonna determine its work plan and what, how they should, uh, what are the items that they wanna deliver to the agency at the end of the year. Um, Yes, the board does go to in front of the legislature to give a yearly report. We would like to have somebody, a representative from, and it's called out in the framework as an example that we would want a representative from this body to join our, 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 our report back to the legislature to say, this is working, this is not working. We would love for you to give us X, Y, and C, um, and hopefully that legislator will support us um, if there's any changes and they want to share with the legislature when we're reporting, they can share that them as well. Um, BS is also, we're hoping to create um, a permanent reporting from the body 
in the public setting as well. Uh, so we're hoping to create a, in a, in a standing agenda item on our board meetings. Um, that way, if, if the body wants to share some of the work that they're working on, and some of the things that are not working, if they're supposed to, if they're not hearing from the TSC as an example, because they told them, hey, we should look at uh, public engagement, and they're refusing to 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 talk about public engagement. They can use our board meetings as a venue to say, hey, we've been trying to get DTSC to share the public engagement plan, and they're not. Uh, we're having some issues, right? So it's, it's it's an opportunity to bring some of the issues and some of the successes um, and, and shed some public um, um, some public um, uh, opportunities to to put some of these issues in the public's eye. Um, in terms of who's going to be the chair and who selects the chair for this body, they are. They're going to decide who and what type. It could be a co-chair structure. It could be three. Um, but they're the ones that are going to determine how they're going to govern govern themselves. They're going to create that structure. We don't want to determine what that what that looks like or who should that be. It's going to be them deciding themselves. And even though the that there is a certain amount of money too, um, I don't know if Diana said it, but they're also going to be determining type, what type of because uh, there will be money allocated for outside support. So if they need scientists or if they need guidance, they're going to determine what that looks like instead of us saying you have money for this and this and this. It's, it's they're going to the ones that are going to determine all of that. Thank you. So this we are doing a hybrid meeting. So there are people in the room and there are people elsewhere um, on Zoom. And so I want to give the people who aren't in the room but are participating an opportunity. So if you're on Zoom, there is a function to raise your hand uh, on the toolbar so that we can acknowledge you that you have a question. And if you are on phone, dialing in, you can hit star nine. And um, then we'll listen to the interpreter and to the person in the room who is monitoring the room. Um, Swatsi, do we have anyone? I wanted to say something really quick regarding the deliverables. Um, the, the, the framework does talk about uh, the work plan being created by, um, by the, or, or yeah, the work plan being created by a combination of the B, the Board of Environmental Safety Board Chair and the DTSC Director, as well as the EJAC Chairs persons. Um, if people agree with that, you know, we would like to know whether or not, you know, that that's a good idea or whether they, folks have different ideas of, around that. Um, but within this work plan, we will be specified the deliverables. And so we've heard from, a, a, like I said earlier, we've heard from people that that it seems like, you know, there there is a lot. Um, um, and it is, um, and it can be a lot. So I think this is, like I said earlier, this is a good platform to really let us know what what should be, um, what what we can focus on. We do provide examples on the on the framework under the work plan heading on what you know what they can, what the the group can um, really focus on. But it, it's really up to them. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Swati, do we have any questions? Um, whomever is monitoring the interpreter at this point, do we have any questions from Spanish? Speakers? At this moment, there are no other hands raised in the Zoom. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question in the Q&A where someone is asking to confirm the first commenter's name and that I believe it was Debbie. Your Your name again, please. Debbie Bear, B A Y E R. Yeah. Should we bring her? Um, Ma'am, do you have a question or a statement? Then, sure, please. You're going to need to come to the mic. I'm sorry, because there are people virtually. In my comprehensive list, I forgot to say one more thing, which is, and this is a good example of where 
and I'm right now the the organization and the neighbors and the activists at Bayview Hunters Point are worried about digging there, releasing radiation. And I don't know that site the way I know Zeneca, but um, I, the Navy has said there's radiation there. And um, I know when you dig up radiation, that's when it's really dangerous. And yet San Francisco, the city of San Francisco, wants to invest a huge amount of money in a big development there. And so that's an area where someone's got to decide what's going on and, and what does protect uh, public health. And, and those are the kind of conflicts that people have to dis have to figure out. And I know the well. That's all I'll say. Yeah. No. Thank you for for that, Debbie. And and you know, I think I I'm a little bit familiar with Bayview Hunters Point just because you know, obviously, it's been a site. It's been a historical legacy site. Um, I know we're working, but this is an example of. If that's an issue of how do we explain the different methods, and I think it's really explaining, you know, what the communities around that site is, number one, am I going to be protected if the cleanup is going to happen? If the cleanup is not going to happen, right, like what are going to be the conditions there, right? I think we have to figure out the different scenarios, and I think really bringing in those conversations um, with our technical experts, with our program staff, with individuals who've been on the site. Um, and I know specifically Todd Sachs, who's the Deputy Director of Site Mitigation and Restoration Program, he's been vividly involved on the site in the last couple of months, just because there has been a lot of activity and discussions with the federal entities, but also responsible parties. Um, this is where this is a perfect example if that's environmental justice advisory committees like prerogative to actually look at specific sites throughout the state and one of the sites will be the Bayview Hunters Point and really kind of looking at the mechanisms that can be a directive that the EJAC can say I want to I want to focus on this and we want to be a part of these discussions but I think being realistic on the deliverables of what can we do within the time frame that we have right I think realistically and what do we want to achieve and those are the discussions that we want the EJAC to actually define for themselves. Because if it was, you know, for the department, we can say we want to work with the EJAC on these things, but they might not be in alignment with what the Environment Justice Advisory Committee members will like to see, right? And that's a conversation that needs to really um, occur. And I think along with the, the Board of Environmental Safety of what are the issues that they're seeing in their discussions with the communities around California that warrant some attention. Um, and I think really the discussion, this is what the department is, you know, we're in the, in, you know, our responsibility is making sure that proper cleanups are done and we oversee the cleanup is getting done. And I think there's some, you know, this is where I think the difficulty is, is do we keep the, the site as is or do we clean it up? And for what purpose? And how do we do it in a way that we bring community along if that's going to happen, right? And I think, you know, I think that's, you just named so many issues that, at the end of the day, not everybody's going to be satisfied, but I think at the end of the day, if a compromise that's transparent is actually put in place, I think that's really what the Environment Justice Advisory Committee is really trying to have, is have a transparent process where individuals are understanding why things are happening and how are we moving forward together. And one of the things that I know, uh, you know, at least in my and experience working with the department, we're working through that and we're in it and it's difficult, but I think it's how do we do it in a way that's actually, again, being responsive and what we think is, is appropriate might not be appropriate, but this is how we can actually work with communities that are going to be impacted by some of the decisions that we're going to be making, right? So um, I don't know if board member um, Georgette or even um, Liz, if you have anything to add. I think, um, that that the way that, that that's kind of one of the reasons um or one of the benefits of having the the ejac um you know under the the dtsc is that that they they'll have that more direct access to folks from from the the dtsc you know to the directors and um that's something that um that you know we as a board can can try to to kind of keep going and, and and really you know be be an ear to the eject you know whether or not that's that's working but i think that um that 
definitely one of the benefits of having it under DTSC um, instead of the board is 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 that direct access, that kind of di uh, guaranteed access, and, and and as well as the 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 the, the logistical benefits that that kind of works. Since you know the Board of Environmental Safety is relatively new, and we're still kind of getting on our own feet. So um, that that was something else I wanted to highlight, and 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 even with that access, I think is is the the increase in transparency and 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 really making these um, those communications public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have any other comments or thoughts um, here in the room or virtually from the translator, the interpreters? Not hearing any. Yes, no. Are those? Yeah. There's no one there. Okay. Um, and seeing none, hearing none, we can move forward to the next slide. Pardon me, Serlene. There is one question in the Q&A from an anonymous participant that says, sorry if I missed before, for DTSC staff supporting the EJAC framework states two part-time staff but I thought I heard two full-time staff at the last BES meeting. Clarification? Clarification on the staffing for the EJAC. I think, so I, you know, I'll take that. And I think, um, I don't know, board member, Gomez, I know you mentioned a little that there's going to be staff support. It's full, two full-time staff members. Um, and sorry if that was not clear, but it's two full-time staff members. That is, that is my understanding. So if it, on the guidelines, if it, hit, if it makes reference to part-time, we will correct it. Once again, the guidelines are in draft form. So this is an opportunity for us to highlight um, the areas that need to be corrected uh, and improve as well. So we are asking folks to give us direct feedback. Um, if, if there is something specific, we welcome it. Um, it can be done today. It can be done later tonight over email or tomorrow. Uh, we are very much eager to hear from the public and how we can make this body the strongest it can be to ensure that DTSC and the BES is doing its work to achieve environmental justice, recognizing that from someone that is committed in my entire life in addressing environmental justice, um, that there's a lot of work to do, be done, not only in this body, but many other agency bodies. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. And and just to provide, and thank you for the question too. And this is something that came out of the discussions when um, this idea of a, of a forum or environmental justice advisory committee was being developed where providing the uh, uh, the suitable resources and capacity, including staffing, um, was something that was needed given an experience that other individuals have participated in other advisory committees and other state agencies that um, staffing wasn't available, at least readily available. So that's something that I do want to give credit to the Rums Justice Organizations that advocated for this um, that also allocated additional staff. So, um, and this is something that's really critical, at least to to point out. Um, but in addition to the two individuals, um, the, the advisory, you know, I, I do want to agree, and I think the, the board members will agree on this, they will have access to, to the department staff um, and also board member staff, um, or at least board uh, staff, just because, you know, obviously we're here. I think the two individuals really in main responsibilities be the facilitator in how we actually um, funnel information between the committee and the department and the board. Um, and, and again, this is going to be something that we're going to be learning, um, given that this is a body that we never had as a department and also as a board. Um, but I think, you know, learning how do we can improve on it is something that we're um, definitely interested and learning too. So, okay. So, so Sandy has identified where the error is, and again, it's a draft. So we'll we'll catch that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll correct that in the final version. Thank you for that. Uh, any other? Comments or questions? Then we can move on to our next steps. I believe that's what's next. 
<laughs> we go into next slide. Okay. Perfect. So, so one of the things that we're going to do, um, at least for next steps, um, and definitely let me know both board member um, Ruiz and, and Gomez if you all want to add anything else, but we really want to receive public comment. Um, we were planning on, on closing on the 21st of July. There were some conversations from individuals of actually extending the public comment because folks want to actually learn a little bit more about this. We're fine with extending the public comment. So it was extended to August 25th, 2023. Um, and this is to uh, board member uh, Gomez mentioned, I would love to get your feedback. And that's either through the different channels of us receiving through um, comments through email or at least verbally we can you know we'll appreciate a verbal comments as well and also if individuals want to actually set up one-on-one -on -one meetings with um with both the department and the board members um, we're happy to do that we have been conducting one-on-one -on -one meetings at the request of some organizations to just kind of go through the 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 forum a little bit um more and we have done that in a way that has been um really helpful um to us and also to the individuals who have, have been requesting these meetings um, one of the things I do want to um, indicate, um, once the comments we have, the, once we have received the comments, we're planning on posting all the comments we have received and also posting the deltas of what the framework is going to change based on the comments. So at least individuals are aware of some of the comments that we have received and how that has modified the framework. And that's really critical um, that we want, you know, we want to actually be responsive because that's one of the recommendations we have received from different organizations of if we're going to be providing you comments, we actually want to be um, notify how are they reflected and then if they were taken and how were there those changes made. Um, and I think we want to actually be um, transparent in that way. So we're going to be posting all the comments we have received um, and then we're going to indicate if they were uh, submitted virtually, um, either through email or if they're submitted, um, you know, uh, like uh, our community member uh, Debbie mentioned or in person um, and how we were responsive to those comments. Um, and we're hoping we're, we'll be ending common period by the 25th. And then soon after that, we're planning on finalizing the framework so we can actually start recruiting for possible membership to the committee. And that's really the end goal of how do we actually start um, having individuals apply. So you can see in the framework, there's an application process that is um, provided, um, but also too, if there's any questions that we should be considering in the application process, this is where uh, we will love to get comments from you guys. Um, and with that, I will, um, I don't know if there's anything additional um, items from both the board members or um, anybody from DTSC. Any more items from the board members? No, um, yeah, just just to really, you know, ask again to to give us, you know, your your feedback um, on on this framework. Um, we really would appreciate it. Um, I mentioned some of the things that we've already heard, you know, um, regarding the 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 amount of work that that's going to be put on this group. Um, and uh, we would also like to hear about, you know, what, what do you think about the number of, of, of members? We did set a, a, a minimum of five. And as Georgette mentioned, the, the maximum by the, set by the, the, the funding is 25. So what, what is too much? What is too little? What, what would be enough to represent the state? That, that's one difficulty I admit we, we have um, really figuring out. So we would really love to hear from him from the public on that. Well, in addition to member rooms, um, just in aside from sending us in, uh, recommendations through email or wanting to set up one of these, um, tomorrow we do have a BES board meeting all day. Um, I'm gonna be reporting on summarizing some of the feedback we've received so far. Um, and we welcome more tomorrow as well. Uh, we are right now trying to work our calendars to try to set up another uh, virtual webinar um, before uh, the period of uh, engaging the public. Uh, so hopefully soonish we'll have. So check out the website. Uh, there'll be an announcement where we would be announcing a webinar, uh, virtual webinar to get uh, additional comments as well. 
So there's still a lot of opportunity to to give us more some of the, the feedback in making this um, either clarifications or improving the document. Uh, so we really want to make sure that folks are engaged. Thank you. Can um, can we have the next? Is there another slide? I think there's one more slide. So um, we were scheduled to have a workshop. And we've made that the virtual workshops, not quite a, a webinar, but still a present and a time to um, participate virtually on uh, July 18th. And that will be information about that will be posted uh, tomorrow uh, on our website so that you can get more information on July 18th. And then we will be looking forward to other ways to engage people in the future in real time. And I believe that's it. So on behalf of everyone, any final words? If there are, me if there are media questions, if media are listening, um, we have Devin Hutchins with our Office of Communications who is available to answer additional questions from the media. And I think that's it. We thank all of you for participating. And we, we ended a few minutes early. But we'll still be here if you have some afterthoughts that you want to share. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. I also wanted to thank all the, all the staff that that put this together behind the scenes. Um, thanks, thanks for everybody's effort on this.